talk, which will be by Fred Harris, and uh, something about timing and synchronization, I believe. This, this talk is filling in for a speaker who couldn't make it. So thanks, Fred Harris. OK, thank you. I told somebody I would show this MATLAB code. So I got to do it. Uh, we're working on that. <laughs> he moonwalks, too. <laughs> okay, so that was one. And the other one I promised I would show would be this one, and we'll go into the actual material. Whenever you teach Fourier transforms, you show that you can build a square wave out of sine waves. So this is an example. Oops. Come on, where are you? Trig 5, got to run it of not building a square wave, but building a train. So watch what you can do with a train. You take away the sine waves. Oh, shoot. Come on, wrong one. Where'd you go? You got hidden. Try it again. It does work. I got a break point? Where? Oh, shoot, shoot, I didn't do that. Come on, go away. Quick what on the far right? Quick right. Quit debugging. I didn't know I was doing that. It says. Quit debugging is all it says. Line 19. Okay. Okay. And right click. On 19. On 19. Okay, we're going to get there. Right click. Okay. Well, it's not doing anything. Okay, we're not going to do that one. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm flexible. <laughs> okay, timing synchronization. Uh, what this is showing, you can use a band edge for things for which it hadn't been designed, and it comes as a surprise to how well it does something outside its original design parameter. And I have other cartoons what it'll do. This came from Don Steinbrecher at Steinbrecher Corporation. We call this a second more machine. Whatever you told the customer, this is what the customer heard. More bells, more whistles, more options, more bandwidth, more, more, more. So Don gave me that, and I found out something was missing, so I added it. Not only does the customer want more, 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 they want to pay less, less, less. Someone at Iridium told me I had to add this slide, so I did. When does the customer want it? Not next week, not tomorrow, they want it now. So it's, it's performance, cost to market, and uh, 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 performance, cost, and time to market. And finally, the last one is, what size does the customer want? OK, two more. This is a cute one. This is the sink or swim option, swimming or sinking. And this is one I use in my, do my synchronization course. If mama is not happy, nobody is happy. And mama is a middle name of synchronizer. No matter how well you design your error correcting code, it has zero value if you haven't gotten past the synchronizer. Yeah, last one. Common line in adventure movies, let's synchronize our watches. OK, when we're trying to do an estimate of some unknown parameter, we go through a correlator. And we try to find the peak of the correlator, which corresponds to the maximum output you can get for that particular estimate. Now, how do you know you're at the peak of the correlator? Well, what you do is you look at the slope where you're standing. You can't ask the correlator, am I at the highest level? Because the correlator hasn't the slightest idea where the highest level is. Correlator only knows where he or she is standing. So the question you should ask is, what's the slope where you're standing? Because if you answer the slope, what's, what's the slope where I'm standing? If it's zero, you're in the right spot. If it's a positive slope, move forward, the peak is in front of you. If it's a negative slope, move backwards, the peak is behind you. So there's the guidance mechanism. Now, how do you know what the slope is? You get some help from a friend. 
In the old days, we used to use something called an early and a late gate. We would build three match filters, prompt, early, late. And the difference between early and late was an estimate of the derivative in between. So we are actually going to take the output of the match filter, differentiate it, and ask what's the slope. The problem is the output of the correlator can be positive or negative. So the slope is required, but not sufficient. You have to qualify the slope by what is the sign, S-I-G-N, of the data. Well, if the signal to noise ratio is high, you can trust the decision it's plus or minus. If the signal to noise ratio is low, you can't trust the decision, so you just multiply the data times the slope. So almost all estimators perform this task. It performs an estimate of the variable. The derivative of the output of that variable takes the product and sets it to zero. Now, our interest is having y dot go to zero. But if you have a product, either one can go to zero and still satisfy the equation. In fact, there are estimators which make y go to zero instead of y dot. So this is the y, y dot model, and it's that negative going zero crossing, which is the operating regime for this time recovery loop. So this is what we evolved. You start with a match filter. You get to early, late. The difference is the derivative. You wind up generating the product, but there's something interesting here. And this is an EV over N0 estimate per sample. You qualify the measurement to say whether it's high SNR or low SNR. If it's low SNR, it makes a smaller contribution to the loop filter. High SNR, it makes a larger contribution. In a sense, it's a match filter for the loop filter. All right, so now we take the difference of the two filters and only run one filter, which is actually a derivative filter. And then we let the filtering and the derivative occur in sample data space. And what the loop filter does, it points which filter should we use. Should we go to an earlier filter or a later filter in a bank of filters which are varied according to their peak offset of the output of the correlator with respect to the timing clock? You don't have to have the timing clock at the peak. You have to have a filter which absorbs the difference between the peak and the timing and the clock. So here's an example of the output of a match filter. And notice all possible transitions are shown, but only the red transitions have a zero derivative. The ones in between aren't going through a maxima, therefore the derivative is not useful. This is the y dot. And notice the y dot only is going to go through zero when the amplitude is going through a local extrema. And if you take the products of the reds, lo and behold, you get your S-curve. All the rest of the products are the curves that doesn't correspond to going through a local extrema. And you have to average for those numbers to get to the estimate of the red curve. Neat little realization of how that happens. Now, I did this for a friend once who was visiting. I wanted to show I could build a set of match filters where each match filter had a different time offset relative to the clock. And then I took the same signal and went through each filter one at a time to see, is there a solution in the box of possible match filters which corresponds to the one which has the maximum eye opening? So that's just a verification that somewhere in the list of filters is the right one. What the loop filter does, or the loop system does, is finds that guy, leaving all the rest behind. That's Doug and Fred, but it's not this Fred. It's a different Fred who was visiting. All right, so we know we can find the derivative of a unknown parameter by differentiating the filter, respect to that unknown, and take the product between the output of the filter and the output of the derivative. If you built a phase lock loop, you would do exactly that. But if the frequency is too, much, too rapidly spinning, the phase lock loop won't require. So this is the only equation I'll write. Uh, it's one of two equations. What I want to do is maximize the output of a correlator. Come on, where are we? There we are. And the output of the correlator is subject to an unknown frequency offset, which is right there. So the output of the correlator is z of t. We want to, and it's a function of omega. And we want to maximize with respect to omega its absolute value. So you take the partial derivative of a magnitude squared, and since it's a variable times a complex conjugate, we wind up it's a variable times the derivative with respect to the uh, conjugation, and you set that to zero. And notice we, this is the product we're talking about, the output of the match filter and the output of the derivative match filter. 
If I do the derivative of this with respect to omega, the most amazing thing happens. With respect to omega, you get a minus jt as part of the match filter. So minus jt times the original derivative match filter is your frequency domain optimum match filter. And you look at that and you have no idea what that means. I didn't initially. But we make this observation. I've got to stop touching something. If you have a time function and a frequency function up here, if you differentiate the time function, you modify the spectrum with a j omega. Ah, now we can go the other way. If you do the derivative of h with respect to omega, you get the time function times jt. So you can either go into the frequency domain and do the derivative, or in the time domain multiplied by jt. And it works out, both of them work, both of them don't work well, because every filter you build is an approximation to your target function as in-band ripple, and the in-band ripple sort of has to be controlled, otherwise this operation doesn't work. So this is the impulse response of the match filter and its spectrum. This is the match filter multiplied by n, which is the same as multiplying by t. And you take its Fourier transform, notice what we have here are the two band edges, hence the name band edge filter. I could have gotten this by differentiating the spectrum directly. There would be the positive slope and there would be the negative slope. It's an odd symmetric function, hence the j that corresponds to the time function. What do you do with a band edge filter? Well, this is the spectrum of the match filter. This is the spectrum of the band edge filter, just doing the derivative. And what happens if the signal went through this filter and then this filter, the only part you would see would be the two band edges. What do the band edges tell you? Well, they tell you where the center of gravity of the mass is. If the central mass is centered, then I have just as much energy on the left and the right, and the energy difference is zero, so that means the signal is centered where it's supposed to be. On the other hand, if the spectrum, let's say, shifted to the left, one of these energy levels went up, one of them went down. The difference says, hey, the energy is further higher on the left than on the right, it means the signal's to the left, and the energy difference is proportional to the frequency offset. So here's the example. Two band edge filters, the primary filter putting the same energy in both. Offset the primary filter to the right, one of them went up. Offset the energy to the left, energy went up. So sufficient to measure the energy difference of those two. Now, this is what you get if you do maximum likelihood estimate of frequency offset. You build your match filter, you build your derivative match filter, do the conjugate product, and the output of this is supposed to be sufficient to drive the frequency difference to zero. Now, while this works, it happens to be maximum likelihood, but it's terribly noisy. There's a variation of this I call minimum variance, which says, I'm going to take those two band edge filters, separate them, generate the sum and difference, which I'll show why in a moment, then do the conjugate product of those instead, and use that parameter to control the frequency offset. So this is my model of a frequency lock loop for frequency offset, but we're supposed to be talking about timing recovery. Why am I wasting your time doing this? Because you have to see what this filter looks like before you see how it's applicable to time. So here I took the two band edge filters, one on the left, one on the right. So it's centered and it has some nominal envelope centered at f symbol over two, a different envelope centered at minus f over two. We generate the sum that looks like the band edges of the original signal. We generate the difference that looks like the band edges you got when you did the derivative. Now, here's the second equation. I generate the sum, which I call C like cosine like, and I generate the difference I call S like sine like, and I do a conjugate product. When you do a conjugate product, this term, sticky fingers, this term times that conjugate is magnitude A squared. This term times that term with a minus sign is magnitude B squared. Well, that's the energy difference in the two filters. It's exactly what you would have expected by knowing the band edges. But if we do the other two terms, which is A times B conjugate and A conjugate times B, this being half a symbol rate, this being minus half symbol rate, when I conjugate, it becomes whole symbol rate. And when you're finished, you wind up taking the difference between a complex number and its conjugate, and the difference between a complex number and its conjugate is twice the imaginary part. So when you do this conjugate product of the sum of these two filters and the difference of these two filters, 
The real part contains the energy difference telling you what the center of gravity offset is. And the imaginary part, most amazing thing, happens to be a clock line exactly at symbol rate and has the phase, which is the phase between the clock and the underlying modulation. Remarkable that no one noticed that before. It was just dumb luck that I noticed it. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the two band edge filters, generate the sum and difference, take the product, and the real part will do the lock on frequency. So this is what you would get if you did maximum likelihood. This is a derivative, derivative filter multiplied by the match filter. And you see the two spectral lines at the two symbols. And there's a DC term here, which is the frequency offset. But you can't see it because all the modulation noise is there. Now we're going to replace it with my version. The sum of the two filters multiplied by the difference of the two filters conjugate. And you get your spectral lines and no modulation noise. Same problem with the DC offset. So I offset spectrum. And I do the filter times the derivative match filter conjugate. And there is a DC term, but you can't see it because it's buried in modulation noise. When you do the conjugate product of the sum and difference, you still get your two spectral lines, which are your symbol line. And you get a DC line whose magnitude is proportional to the frequency offset. And the sign tells you whether you shifted left or shifted right. Wonderful way to acquire frequency. So we're going to leave frequency alone and now go after timing. So here are the two band edge filters all by themselves. We generate the conjugate product. And lo and behold, you get a pair of spectral lines and nothing at DC. There's no frequency offset. Now there's a frequency offset. You can see it. The guy on the right is fatter than the guy on the left. Do the conjugate product. And lo and behold, this is the entire spectrum. This is the real part of the spectrum and the imaginary part of the spectrum. The DC term in the front is proportional to frequency offset, but our interest is the two on the right. Now, where do you get the insight of what the guys on the left and right are doing? This is the eye diagram for the output of the match filter. We know exactly what an eye diagram looks like. Curiosity led me to ask this question. I wonder what the eye diagram looks like for the two new signals I built, the sum of the two band edges, and the difference of the two band edges. Well, this is the eye diagram for the sum, and this is the eye diagram for the difference. And notice the zero crossing on the difference exactly coincides where the eye is open. So we're going to track that zero crossing to find the timing. This is non-data aided. This just uses the statistics on the output of the two band edge filters. So here is what you would get. The top curve is the eye diagram without going through the match filter yet. The bottom curve, the two next curves are the eye diagram of the sum of the two signals and the difference of the two signals. If you generate the conjugate product of these two, we get this little curve down here whose average value happens to be this red line. You get an S curve by simply taking the product of the uh, sum of the two band edges and the difference of the two band edges. If there's a phase offset, as there is now, my clock line is at 0. The 0 crossing is here. When you do the conjugate product of these two, you get a non-zero output, which is positive or negative, telling you to move left or move right to find where the null is. That's what you're looking for. Now, this is some comment I about yesterday. We had a presentation on excess bandwidth in a filter. These are a bunch of filters with different excess bandwidths. These are the corresponding deny diagrams. Notice you have small excess bandwidth, you have high peak to average ratio. If you have lots of excess bandwidth, there's almost no difference between peak and average value. But there's no spectral line. If you simply look at the data, you need to get the spectral line by going through a nonlinearity. And here, the nonlinearity is the absolute value. And when you look at the eye diagram, absolute value, you, mo you make this amazing observation. The mean value is now time dependent. And this variance is now time dependent. If the statistics are time dependent and it's a periodic time dependency, it's called a cyclostationary process. When we do synchronization, that's the guy we're looking for, those periodic statistics. And here are those periodic statistics for different values of excess bandwidth, from 10% to 90%. And notice the amplitude of the periodic component gets bigger and bigger. If you have more excess bandwidth, you're feeding more energy into your synchronizer your synchronization will occur more rapidly. So this is what you get if you do the maximum likelihood. You take the output of the match filter, 
multiply by the conjugate of the derivative match filter, and lo and behold, you get the pair of spectral lines. But you get all that junk in between, which happens to be the modulation noise. Now we do it only on the difference filter. We do the sum of the two band edges and the difference of the two band edges. We now look at the eye diagram of the difference, and then we do the conjugate, and then we look at the magnitude, and lo and behold, you get the same mean invariance, which tells you something interesting. All the information that the synchronizers need reside in the band edges. There's nothing in between which will assist the synchronizers. The stuff in the middle is payload, but the stuff on the outside is the package that carries the payload, and the synchronizer needs that. And those mean invariances are also a function of the excess bandwidth. Give me more excess bandwidth, there's more energy in those statistics, and because there's more energy, it'll be easier to synchronize. Okay, now this is the band edge sum times the band edge difference conjugated, and notice you see the wonderful spectral lines, each one getting higher as you have more excess bandwidth, and you get a little bit of the modulation noise in the bandwidth of the band edge filter. And you filter that out with your loop filter. Now, what's interesting, suppose there's a frequency offset. If there's a frequency offset, your eye diagram is spinning. That's what the top curve shows. And as the eye diagram spins, it starts reducing the amplitude of the cyclostationary component. The two band edge filters, if you spin them, there's no difference at all in those statistics. The two band edge filters are independent of any frequency offset. So these are the two band edge filters, products. It, with a frequency offset, you can see the two timing lines, you can see the DC line at DC. This is the cyclostationary component for the spectrum that came out of the um, original um, eye diagram for the spinning data. And you can see the, the mean invariants are now becoming shorter distance between the peak and the minima. But if you do this with the spinning band edge filter, there's actually no difference at all. Because you spin zero, it stays zero. You spin a big number, it stays a big number. OK, so this is what a standard Homer problem would look like for a modem design. But this has, of course, a frequency lock loop, uses a band edge filter, it has a timing response loop, it has a, cyclo it has a, uh, a polyphase filter bank, finally it has an equalizer and a phase lock loop. But we want to do this with only the band edges. This happens to be what the frequency lock loop would see. You would see there's an offset between the filter and the spectrum. It measures that offset and pulls it back in and locks it up. And this is the energy difference that comes from the two filters. And then this is the, the slope of the two oscillators, the one spinning the data on the way in, the one that de-spins it inside. And this is the amplitude of the signal difference between the two band edges. We stop it from spinning, and we get an unknown phase. Doesn't care what the modulation is. This is a neat little trick. This little loop has a band edge filter in it. You generate the positive and negative band edges, generate some indifference, take the product. The real part runs the phase lock loop. The imaginary part runs the timing loop. And when you come out of here, it's already un no longer spinning, and it's already timed. So this phase lock loop doesn't have to do timing. This loop has to run at four samples per symbol. Why is that? Because when you double the signal, when you gen generate the product at symbol rate, you don't want that to land at the half sampler rate. And that's what you would get if you only ran at two samples per symbol. So it has to run at four samplers per symbol. Chris Dick once complained to me, he said, Fred, I don't want to run my system at four samples per symbol. So in desperation, you make a change. If the customer wants it, you fix it. So I ran the system at two samples per symbol, but before I did this conjugate product, I interpolated up. So the two band edge filters are running at two samples per symbol, interpolate to four. You know how to do that. We're good at that, in fact. Then this little loop, which is doing the time recovery, runs at four samples per symbol, and the rest of the loops run at two and one sample per symbol. Now, what's interesting is why is there a variance in the observations when you're doing timing recovery? Well, what happens, it's not the noise which you're fighting, it's your modulation, which looks like noise. So if I were trying to estimate this timing position, but are standing out here, I would see these amplitude variations, which are the transitions between previous and current state. 
And if I'm trying to find the zero crossing, I don't see the zero crossing. I see the spread, which are due to the transition. This is known as the Gardner loop. Well, Gardner said, instead of making y, y dot make y dot go to zero, let's make y go to zero. So you take the sample on the left and sample on the right. Here's my left sample, if I get the mouse. Left sample, right sample. If they are different sign, there must have been a zero crossing. You take the difference of these two, which estimates the slope, and the slope times this amplitude is the y, y dot. And what will happen as you pull this guy over, eventually, this little red line in the middle, I should have had my mouse here. Well, you know where the middle is. <laughs> OK. That middle would have been had the average value of 0. And so this is the, uh, the difference between the sample to the left, sample to the right, detected. That's your slope. And that times y is going to try to drive this term to 0. If you're negative going 0, crossing is early, you have to shift over. If the negative going 0, crossing is late, you have to shift backwards. Neat little trick. OK. I, this is really why I'm here, this presentation. I say there were, th how's my, oh, someone said something. OK. What we want to do is ask, I wonder what the variance is of the three d different kinds of timing detectors. There's a maximum likelihood, the Gardner, and my band edge filter. And these will be a function of the excess bandwidth. So these are the S-curves for the maximum likelihood. And the S-curves, of course, if you have more excess bandwidth, there's more energy. So you can see the S-curve has a higher slope. These are the standard deviation relative to the mean. Once you estimate the mean, which is the S-curve, you can see what the variance is as a function of the offset. So that was for the uh, maximum likelihood. We do the same thing for the Gardner loop. It's got the similar looking S-curve and it has a similar increase in variance when you move off the spot where the eye is maximally open. And this is what it is for the band edge filters. You notice there's absolutely zero variance around the mean when you're centered at the mean. And the variance that you go away from the mean is significantly smaller than it was in the other three cases. And here's the rule. The guy on the left is the Gardner loop. The guy in the middle is the maximum likelihood. And the one on the right is the band edge filter S-curves. And these are the standard deviations relative to the mean. And you can see the standard deviation for the band edge filter is about an order of magnitude smaller than the standard deviation for maximum likelihood and for the Gardner loop. Interesting realization. You zoom in, you can see it's a function of the excess bandwidth. The more excess bandwidth you have, the more energy. Um, let's see. The less excess bandwidth, there's more, the longer the tails are in the curve, there's more variation around the mean. So that's it's interesting to see that. But notice the one on the right versus the two on the left in the middle. OK, and there the tails are what causes the memory, and the memory is what causes the variance to be bigger. Now, these are three different spectra with three different bandwidths, 25, 50, and 75% excess bandwidth. The question is, what in heaven's name does a band edge filter look like? Well, here's the example where here are the two band edge filters, which I'll show in a moment. And notice their frequencies are plus or minus 0.5. When you do the conjugate product, they double out to 1. And that's why your sample rate had to be 4, because otherwise these two would land on the same spot. All right, so this is one way I used to build band edge filters. I know the analytic equation for the half cycle of a cosine, which is this band edge. I know exactly what that equation is for a cosine taper. I build that analytic function, but I don't want to drop down too rapidly, so I do analytic continuation and fill it out. And it fills up some extra noise out here. It used to bother me, but I say, well, I'll live with it. And this is what you get when you use that same band edge filter in the maximum likelihood. This is what you get when you use the, uh, uh, sorry, this is the Gardner loop band edge. He doesn't use the band, yes, this is using the band edge. No, this isn't the band edge. This is the spectral line generated from that funny looking product. This is the spectral line from the derivative and the original. And these are the spectral lines. And you can see this extra bandwidth here on the edges, because I made this slightly wider than it had to be to make it a smooth continuous curve. Subsequently, I said, I can do better than that. So I'll do this. 
will take the original impulse response and do something strange. Simply multiply by n. When you multiply by n, you get the derivative. But then you have to put a window on to control the discontinuity. Because you multiply by n, you're increasing the size of the discontinuity at the edge. Oh, this one happens to be simply the, the analytic continuation one. Next one is what I want. This is where I multiply by n, put a window on, and now you get a non-analytic continuation, which is actually a pretty good model of simply the derivative of the band edge filter. And we're finished. This is it. So this is the funny looking S curves, and this is my closing slide. Professor Harris might be excused. My brain is full, and I actually have my advertisement. Is it true that DSP makes the world go round, but multi-rate signal processing supplies and music for the ride? And the answer is yes. OK. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, I had three papers. So when you get a copy of this when we distribute it, there are three papers cited, which are articles on how do you build band edge filters? What do they look like, and how do they perform? It's in my pocket. You can have it. Okay, we'll take a question while we get the next speaker set up. Hey, Fred. Uh, so thanks. Yes. That's maybe I don't know what the twenty twenty fifth time I've probably seen you uh, go through your slides in all the years we've been working together. Uh, quick plug, the FLL band edge filter uh, in GNU Radio is the implementation of that band edge filter that Fred started with before he like puts in the timing, so that's in there. One thing that I've never quite gotten, Fred, is with the band edge filter, uh, what happens when there is adjacent signals or co-channel or adjacent channel interference to the, uh, how does it affect the, uh, the closing behavior of that band edge uh, synchronizer? Well, if you if you do have that band energy on the side, it's going to bias the estimate of the uh, frequency. You have to live with it. You have to do some house cleaning. In fact, what you should possibly do is go through a match filter first, if it's a small offset, or do something close to it to reject the neighbors. Yeah, if it's a small offset, but okay, yeah, okay. I just want to yeah, I just want to make but, sure that I wasn't but, missing something with uh, but, but the, the co-channel. One. The last penalty, if your channel has distortion, it'll change the amount of energy in the two band edges. And the system will think there's a frequency offset and try to compensate. Okay. Thank our speaker. Thank you.